Welcome yet again to the next episode here at Grace Track, where we are discussing theology, doctrine, and how to, today, understand who God actually is. So we're going to start the discussion that will go for several episodes on the doctrine of God. We're going to talk about the knowability of God. Can we actually know who God is? And then we're going to talk about the transcendence and the imminence of God. So, Larry, why don't you kick us off with discussing uh, the knowability of God. One of the first questions that people ask after the question, does God exist, is if the answer is yes, then can I know him? Now, in a few moments, Pastor Jeff's going to teach us about this big word called transcendence and then also, also eminence. But just as a quick heads up, uh, transcendence means that God is other than us. It means more than that too. But we understand that, that God would not be exactly like us. God is other than us. But we can know him, and here's the key, because of his self-revelation to us. We can know God because God in his grace and mercy and love has introduced himself to us and told us about himself. Now, you might ask, well, how has God done this? Well, again, a quick review from some previous episodes. We said in uh, three or four ways. One, we call it general revelation, and that's through creation in our conscience we know some things about God. And then there's special or specific revelation. And that is we know more specific things about God through his revealed scripture. And certainly the ultimate revelation of God of himself to us is through the person of Jesus Christ. The point here is to say that when we talk about the knowability of God, we mean that God is knowable because of his self-revelation to us. Now, here's something important to remember. We can know um, some things about God, what he's revealed to us, but we can't know everything about God. Now, think about this. It's because God is omnipotent, right? God is mm -hmm. omnipresent. He's omniscient. Right. We are not, and that's partly what we mean when we say God is other than us because he's greater than us, than us in those ways. But here's what we do know. God has revealed all that he wants us to know about himself for now, okay? So whatever it is that God wants you to know about himself, he has revealed that to us through creation, conscience, scripture, and through Jesus. Pastor Jeff, I think this is really comforting and encouraging also, and here's why. You know, sometimes we have doubts, um, and we all have questions, and I wanna encourage you that if you're going through a time of doubt and questions about God, first of all, know that you will always have questions about God. Mm -hmm. Because he's transcendent, you will never reach a point um, in all of eternity where you know everything there is to know about God. If you reach a point where you know everything there is to know about God, then you're going to be God. But again, for today, God has revealed all that we need to know about him so that we can know him and so that we can place our trust in him for our salvation mm -hmm. and eternal life. That's a pretty mind-blowing uh, thought when you consider that when you die and you're with the Lord in heaven and you're learning about the Lord, you will never reach a point after you've been there 10,000 years where you're able to take a final exam and now you know everything there is to know about God. That just reminds us how magnificent mm -hmm. um, God really is. But again, I want to emphasize, just because, we do, just because we don't know everything about God doesn't mean we don't know anything. We know enough to know him and to um, trust him. Now, when we talk about um, God being knowable, it also means that it's not just that we know about God, it means that we can know God on a personal, relational level. So when we talk about the knowability of God, we don't, we're not just talking about knowing about God, we're talking about knowing God to the extent that we can put our trust in him. Mm -hmm. Now, my wife, Ethel, and I have been married for about 32 years. And I was thinking, if I was walking down the street and a stranger came up to me and said, hey, buddy, would you do me a favor? I might be like, uh, you know, I don't know you, probably not. Um, why? Because there's no trust there, because I don't know that person. Uh, on the other hand, if my wife says, hey, honey, would you do uh, a favor for me? I would probably still be hesitant because <laughs> she's probably going to put me to work. <laughs> but, uh, but I would be more likely to say That's yes. Why? Because awesome. I've known her for many, many years. Is she, right? gonna watch, she, she may not watch this. You'd be in trouble. <laughs> this will be the one I tell her. Just skip this one. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah you yeah, already yeah. know really all this <laughs> so, um, so the stranger I may know about in some way, but there's not a trust level that I'm mm -hmm. actually going to you know, follow. But with, uh, with my wife, the trust level is very high. Why? Because the, the, the level of knowledge is so much higher. So again, my point is the better you know God, the more you're going to be able to trust the Lord. 
It's interesting when you study uh, John's writings in the New Testament. He wrote five of the books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. He's got the Gospel of John, his three letters that we call mm -hmm. First, Second, and Third John, and then of course he wrote the last book, the Book of Revelation. But you discover when you read his Gospel in particular in his three letter letters, First, Second, and Third John, he uses this word "no" K N O W dozens of times. But whenever he uses it, he means more than just, again, knowing facts about God. He takes it to another level, and he's talking about this personal experience with God. So again, when we talk about the knowability of God, we don't just mean being able to retain intellectual facts about God. That's certainly important. But God wants us to take it to another level. He's revealed himself to us so that we can have this intimate, personal relationship with him. In fact, Jesus said this in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Again, that word know, K-N-O-W, means more than just get the facts right. It means to have that personal, intimate relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, the great commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, it's awfully hard to love someone who you don't know. So God, when we talk about his knowability, means that yes, we can know him because he's revealed himself to us, and it even goes to the level that he's revealed himself to us so that we can experience him in this personal, intimate relationship. Just a quick word about how can I get to know God better? Well, there's some really basic things. First of all, you have to receive Christ. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's what it means to know God, is to experience God through relationship with Jesus Christ. And then after you've received Christ, that's why God gave us the Bible. It's so that we could know God. Another great way to get to know God better is to obey Him. And the more you obey Him, the more He's going to guide you and you're going to experience His peace and power in your life. Certainly, certainly prayer is a great way to know the Lord, having a conversation with God where you pray and He speaks back to you through His Word. Fellowshipping with other Christians, that's another way we can experience in God. Sharing your faith with other people. That's another way you can experience God on this intimate level. But what a blessing it is to know not just that God exists, but also that God exists and we can know him on this personal, intimate, friendship, relational level. Mm. Good word. Yeah. Good word. There's so much more that could be said on this. And so, Larry, that's sort of like the tip of the iceberg. But oh, that's, yeah. that's just great, great uh, handles, if you will, great steps that we can pursue that uh, on a deeper on a deeper level as we seek to know the Lord in a deeper way. And uh, I heard an illustration one time, Larry, about um, the closer we get to the Lord, the more we grow in our walk, the more mature we become as Christians, the more we see ourselves in need of Him. Oh, yeah. So if you're a follower of Christ, whether you've walked with Jesus for years or whether you're brand new in the faith, and sometimes you're just like, man, I, I look in my own heart and I see issues in my own life and I'm not exactly sure I'm where I need to be with God, know that in the scriptures, especially the New Testament, the people that were furthest from God are the ones who thought that they needed no forgiveness, sure. right? The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, man, they thought they had it all together. In fact, there's one guy in the Gospel of Luke, and his prayers are recorded in the Bible. He goes to the, the, right, the synagogue <laughs> temple, and, he, and he, his prayer, literally to God, he's looking at this other guy. God, I thank you I'm not like that guy. Yeah. And Jesus said the guy who was kneeling down before God, literally beating his chest, saying, God, please forgive me. I confess my sin. He said that guy went away cleansed of his sin. Mm -hmm. And the guy who was, God, thank you that I'm not like all these other people, that man went away still yeah. in his sin. So we just want to say just from our heart to you guys, whether, again, you're a new Christian or whether you are a Christian of decades, knowing the Lord just creates a deeper and deeper level of how holy and gracious and loving and awesome he is and how much more we need him now that we see than even five years ago oh, yeah. when we were followers of Christ then. So we want that to encourage you if you deal with, man, I, I just need the Lord more and more. That You're on the right track, <laughs> like you're on the right track. But we don't want to at the same time allow Satan to use the knowledge of our sin, the knowledge of our inconsistencies and our failures to crush us. What that should do is exalt the power of Jesus oh, yeah. as opposed to just grind us in the dirt. And that's what the enemy wants to do. But Jesus is the one who lifts our head. Mm. 
So speaking of the power of God, the nature of God, there's a couple of attributes here, Larry, that we can flesh out further. The transcendence and the eminence of God. But before we do that, we want to just mention why would we even study this? Like, is, 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 this, is this stuff, Larry, just for nerds, right? And people are like, oh, let me read a big book or a theology. And we, like, we, and we, and we would be, find ourselves reading anyway. No, we study these things because we love the Lord. Yeah. And when you, when you love a person, when you care deeply for a person, you want to know more yep. about them. You yep. want to know what they like, what they, what they don't like, their heart and their deepest desires and what they hold dear. And also, we study this because, man, God is fascinating. Like, if yeah. it's even remotely true that it's plausible that God exists, God is the most interesting, fascinating being yeah. in the entire known universe. Yeah. And so whether it's just out of a desire, man, that sounds interesting, or whether it's just a deep desire to know the heart of Christ, both of those streams can lead us to him, to a deeper knowledge that should and can lead to a deeper walk and commitment with him. But transcendence, what is that? Transcendence is that God is separate from his creation. God created the world, but God is not the world. Right. In other words, God is, if you're looking for a category, God is other. God is far above creation, in the words of one theologian, in the sense that he is greater than the creation and that he is independent of it. In other words, God is not the mountain, right? right? Like God is not Mount Everest. And here in South Florida, we have a great mountain that is well known and famous. It's called Mount Trashmore <laughs> up on the, uh, <laughs> on the turnpike for those of you that make sure that you turn your AC to recirculate when you drive by, right? Like God is not stuff. God is not a mountain. God is not the sky. God is not the rivers. God is not our pet. And you know the difference between dogs and cats, Larry, What's right? That? When it comes to that, that dogs believe that you're God and cats believe that they are God, right? <laughs> so God is not stuff. God is not things. In fact, that's a lot of the Old Testament. God sends his prophets mm -hmm. to basically say, guys, guys, stop worshiping rocks. Yeah. Like, don't do that. Don't worship sticks. Don't worship wood. And, and Jeremiah gives this hilarious explanation. It's like, you go to the, the woods, you chop down a tree, you use part of the tree to cook your lunch, and then you fashion the other part of the tree to an idol, and you bow down to it. Like, that is irrational in the Old Testament. And so, just for our accurate understanding of God, God is separate from His creation. God is not synonymous with the creation. However, there's also what we find in Scripture, the eminence of God. And that's mm. not eminence in the, in, the, um, in the sense of God is about to, to be here. Mm. It's in the sense of God is also active in His creation. God is mm -hmm. not His creation, but God is active within it. Mm. And this is in contradiction or in opposition, I should say, to the deists that were very popular several mm -hmm. hundred years ago to where they believed because of Newton's uh, laws of physics that God just kind of wound up the universe like a clock and just sat back on his lawn chair, if they had lawn chairs back in the 1700s, and, <laughs> and just kind of watched the natural process go. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe that God actually did anything into the world. That's not what Scripture actually teaches. Mm -hmm. Scripture teaches that, again, God is not his creation, but God is accurate, or he, God is involved within it. Colossians 1.17 says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That God is active in the world. We see the transcendence of God in Isaiah chapter 6. If you guys are going to go read that entire chapter, it's incredible, where he sees the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and God is holy. Uh, we see in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 and 24, God says, Am I not a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? In other words, he is separate from his creation, but he sees and he's aware of everything that transpires in his creation. So mm. the importance or the implications of the imminence of God um, means that God can and does work through miracles. God, yes, mm -hmm. has established the natural laws that's 
that's the order of the day, but God can choose to temporarily suspend those natural laws, case in point, the resurrection of Christ. Sure. Like on average, dead men don't rise. <laughs> But yeah. if it fits within God's plan, if Jesus was the Son of God, and that was God's plan to bring him uh, back from the dead, never to die again, then that is God working in the world. Mm. And so the importance of transcendence is that God is not bound by the limitations of his creation. That human beings were not, uh, were not supreme over all things, but were given value from God and for us to have that reverence for God to know that he is separate from his creation but he's involved in the world involved in the universe involved in our lives that gives us the ability to see the power of God but also mm -hmm. the one who is in control of all of this wants to have that personal relationship mm -hmm. and that connection with us. Pastor Jeff I was thinking uh, this great explanation you're given of transcendence and eminence I was thinking of a passage in the Old Testament, New Testament that probably all our viewers are familiar with, the 23rd Psalm, mm. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord, transcendence, is yeah. my shepherd, That's good. eminence. And then in the New Testament, um, the Lord's Prayer, right? Mm. Our Father, eminence, which art in heaven, transcendence. There you go. So I love it. All through Scripture you see this great um, you know, combination, if you will, yeah. of God being transcendent above and other than us in his creation, but also being imminent that we can know him and relate mm. to him. Thank you for great, explaining this to great us. Great word, <laughs> great word. Mm -hmm. And two, in the future, we've mentioned this before, we would love to build additional layers onto our Grace Track initiative. One of those layers would be apologetics, and we could get into more details of pantheism and dualism and materialism and those things that are false understandings of who God actually right. is. Yeah. But as far as the purposes for our discussion today, it's unique within Christianity that we have a God whose transcendence is there. His power is unmatched. There is nothing that can stand against the Lord. But yet, it's mm. he's got that desire to to know us. Yeah. And like you're saying, he's yeah. my shepherd. And in, and in Matthew, the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, you know, Jesus is like, like why, why are you guys worrying? Like, like he, he knows, like he knows when a sparrow yeah. falls to the ground. And so if you can have in one, in one person, one being that level of power, but yet that level of care mm. for the individual person and what they're walking through and what they're going through, that is the beauty of the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus, who was there in heaven, he had no need, there were no issues, he came down, he came as one of us in the form of a servant, voluntarily uh, to take our sins upon mm -hmm. himself. So whether you're talking about ancient uh, Manichaean dualism, which is what Augustine came out of, that was his belief before being a follower of Christ, or whether you're talking about, you know, some mistaken understanding of is the star, is Star Wars real, right? Is like, you know, the God, is God the force? And none of that is the case, all right? You find only in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we want to emphasize and hit this again and again, you find nowhere else that level of power but yet that level of love for the person. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> and that's demonstrated through the cross of Christ. Yeah. So we're so glad that you were here with us in this episode of Grace Track. We look forward to next episode rolling out some additional uh, truths about the attributes of God. And we look forward to seeing you here at Grace Track next time.